Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to call the subcommittee to order. Without objection, the um, chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time today. I'd like to begin by noting some important requirements. Let me begin by saying that the standing house rules and committee rules will be in practice today and will apply during these remote proceedings. All members are reminded that they are expected to hear to these standing rules, including decorum, when they are in fact participating in any uh, remote event. With that said, the technology that we are utilizing today requires us to make some small modifications to ensure that members can fully participate in these hearings. House regulations uh, require members to be visible through a video connection throughout the proceedings, so please uh, keep your cameras on. If you have to participate in another proceeding, please exit and then log back in later. In the event that a member encounters technical issues that prevent them from being recognized for their questioning, I will then move to the next available member of the same party and will recognize that member at the next appropriate time slot, provided that is that they have returned to the proceedings. Should a member be interrupted by technical issues, I will recognize that member at the next appropriate spot for the remainder of their time once those issues have in fact been resolved. In the event that a witness loses connectivity during testimony or questioning, I will preserve their time as staff attempts to address whatever technical issue may be at hand. Uh, I may need to recess the proceedings to provide time for witnesses to reconnect. And finally, please remember to remain muted until you are recognized to be able to minimize background noise. In accordance with staff rules, staff has been advised to mute participants only in the event that there is inadvertent background noise. Should a member be recognized, they obviously then must unmute themselves to seek recognition again at the appropriate time. Um, I wanna thank all of you for participating in this meeting, this hearing, and to say to you that I'm hoping that we uh, make a great deal of progress as we get through the day and all that we have to do. The United States government is the largest purchaser of goods and services in the world. In fiscal 2020 alone, federal agencies obligated more than $650 billion in federal contracts. They did that through their buying power because the federal government is uniquely positioned to incentivize the economy and to strengthen the industrial base. Thus, it really is vital that small businesses then have an ample opportunity to compete in this space. When small firms have the ability to compete and then win federal contracts, American entrepreneurs and the federal government all benefit. Unfortunately, the federal small business supplier base has shrunk a staggering 40% over the last decade. This right. decline means less opportunity then for small businesses to support livelihoods and to support the communities that they in fact serve. Now, while this decrease can't be attributed to any one factor, it is safe, I think, to say that category management has been a driving force behind the decline of a number of small firms serving as federal prime contractors. Category management, or CM as it is known, is a government-wide procurement initiative that involves buying common goods and services as a single enterprise. The intended goal, as we know, of the initiative is to eliminate redundancies, increase efficiencies, and deliver more savings by leveraging the federal government's buying power. Now, these are all worthy goals, but the policy has resulted in pushing small businesses in many instances out of the federal procurement space. Category management discourages the use of individual contracts and consolidates requirements into large contracting vehicles, leading to less competition and then ultimately fewer contracting opportunities. In 2020, the GAO issued a report showing that while dollars and contract actions have grown for small businesses within the CM initiative, the overall number of small businesses and vendors receiving awards had in fact declined. So to put it mildly, I think it's fair to say that a select number of small businesses were able to navigate and benefit this complex system, while many, many others were pushed out altogether. In fiscal year 2016, 92,000 plus small businesses provided common products compared to just 79,000 of those same businesses in three years, a drop of 17% in that 36 month period. 
If this trend persists, it will have a severe consequence, both for the federal government and for the small business base. Fewer small businesses will lead to less innovation, higher costs, and then ultimately a weaker supply chain. So I think it's not a stretch for me to say that all members of this committee believe in bringing in more efficiency and less redundancy to our procurement system. Yet we can't advance the goals at the expense of small businesses, which are still and will always be the backbone of our economy. That's why we must ensure that the implementation of this initiative doesn't run counter to the protections that are afforded small businesses under the Small Business Act. And so I look forward to the hearing. I look forward to our panel today to be able to talk about the challenges that category management, management continues to pose for small businesses and what, in fact, this subcommittee and what Congress can do. With that, I'd like to yield to the ranking minority member, Ms. Salazar of Florida, for her opening statement. Ms. Salazar. Yes, thank you, Chairman, for being here with us and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to the rest of the, uh, sorry, to the rest of the subcommittee and uh, and appreciate you holding this hearing to support greater small business participation in federal government contracting. As I explained to you, I wanted to do it in person, so it was. Uh, it's a lot more. It's a lot more um, uh, warmer, and we can definitely share more thoughts. But I understand that now is the time to do this via Zoom. Hopefully, next time we will be able to do it in person in Washington. So, small businesses are critical to our nation's security, innovation, and the economy. And because of this, the federal government needs a strong small business supplier base. I will not mince words, the small business supplier base is dying and it's the federal government's fault. In the last decade, the number of small contractors shrank, as you said, by nearly 40%. Let me say it again, we have lost over one third of our small contractors in less than 10 years. If that doesn't shock us, let me tell you more. In the last 15 years, the number of new entrants to the federal marketplace declined by nearly 80%. Clearly, the federal procurement environment has become so hostile to new small business that they just don't even try it. We need to act now to stop this exodus, and we at the federal level need to figure out what's happening. For instance, we need to reevaluate the government's use of what you call contract bundling. That happens when several small contractors are combined into one unnecessarily large contract. Another problem is what we called category management. That is when contracts are grouped together in categories, but this leads to picking winners and losers, and that is not our job at the federal level. That is the marketplace job. To be fair, Category management has noble goals, and as of recent, small business contracts can now be classified as, as tier one contracts, an upgrade from before. Category management can also be useful to track federal purchasing habits, identify efficiencies, and keep contracting costs down. But that said, we cannot be naive when it comes to how this will impact our small business suppliers. And I'm gonna give you an example. The government is increasing spending towards best in class contracts, which according to the government are the preferred and recommended contract methods. But these contract methods is at this hour are only benefiting few contractors from above the rest stifling competition and reducing opportunities. In other words, the current category management efforts appear to be benefiting the few to the detriment of many. And the end result is the federal government, while desperately looking to save a few pennies, is destroying the small business supplier base. Let me share another example. The Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, Eliminated one whole category of contracts called the tier zero contracts. They celebrated this as a major success. They said that it would only impact 5% on small businesses. But let me tell you something. There was another fact check conducted by the Government Accountability Office that it said that that new practice um, eliminated 
con uh, thousands of opportunities for small businesses that have been eliminated by the category management. In other words, it just didn't work. I promised my constituents in district number 27 that I was that one of my goals from this office, the congressional office, was to make thousands and thousands of them, thousands of small business owners, vendors of the federal government. And it hasn't happened. So let me conclude with this thought. The decline of small business federal contractors translates directly to less competition and less innovation. This comes on the heels of another disastrous job report. In September last month, the United States economy added only 200,000 new jobs compared to the 500,000 that was expected. So the federal government must do a lot more to provide opportunities for the small business in this country. I thank you. And I, want, I would like to thank the witnesses for their expert testimony today, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Salazar. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, I'd like to take a moment now to explain how this hearing will in fact proceed. Each witness will have five minutes to provide a st statement and each committee member will have five minutes for questions. Please ensure, as I've mentioned earlier, that your microphone is on when you begin speaking and that you return to mute when you finish. With that said, I'd like to introduce the order of our, our witnesses. Our first witness is Ms. Alba Allman, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, the founder and CEO of Citizen Incorporated, located in Chantilly, Virginia. Citizen is a certified women-owned business and a former 8A firm. The company specializes in creating solutions to complex government IT challenges, including application development, testing, automation, enterprise data management, and quality process improvement. Ms. Ullman has led Citizen through 22 years of successful service delivery on mission-critical government programs. Welcome, Ms. Ullman. Our next witness will be Lynn Ann Casey, the founder and CEO of Art Especio, a certified women's own small business. Arc Especio is a consulting and solutions company that provides and solves problems, I should say, by applying integrated capabilities in strategy, design, data, human capital, behavioral science, and in technology. Ms. Casey founded Arc Especio in 2004 and has a proud career of driving innovation for government agencies. Welcome, Ms. Casey. Our third witness today will be Mr. Victor Holt, founder and CEO of VTech Solutions Incorporated. VTech is a Hub Zone One certified former 8A and veteran zone small business that offers uh, technology, information, and a wide range of professional services. Mr. Holt founded VTech in 2000 after serving in the United States Air Force and working in the private sector for Lockheed Martin. Northrop Grumman and Hewlett Packard. We appreciate your time and expertise, Mr. Holt. Welcome to you as well. I will now yield to the ranking member to introduce our final witness, Ms. Salazar. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our final witness is so Sophia Tong. She is the founder and chief executive officer of, of T and T Consulting Services Incorporated, a woman-owned small business. Mrs. Chong is also a graduate of the Small Business Administration's 8A program. Under her leadership, TNT has grown from a small two-person business in 2004 to over 100 employees at this time. Under Mrs. Chong's direction, TNT has achieved numerous difficult to obtain certifications and boasts a diverse array of federal government and commercial clients. Mrs. Tung holds a, over 15 years of experience in software engineering and project manager. She has uh, earned a Master of Science in Computer Science from the University of Maryland and her Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Information Engineering from the National Chiao Tung University in Taiwan. She is a certified project manager professional and is also information technology infrastructure library certificate. Due to her hard work and exemplary leadership skills, Mrs. Tung has received many 
accolades, including the 2018 American Business Awards Executive of the Year Award, the Washington Business Journal's 2018 Minority Business Leader Award, and the 2019 Small Business Administration Small Business Person of the Year in Northern Virginia. Mrs. Tong, I look forward to hearing your testimony, and I yield back. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Ms. Salazar. Ms. Ullman, you are now recognized for five minutes. Please proceed. Good morning, Chairman Ampume, Ranking Member Salazar, and members of the House Small Business Committee, Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the topic of category management. My name is Alba Aleman, and I'm the founder and CEO of Citizens, a small government services firm based in Chantilly, Virginia. We employ nearly 200 professionals who support federal agencies in 27 states. I am an active member of the Women's Chamber of Commerce and serve on their category management task force. Citizen has been in business since 1999, and we have weathered many storms, Y2K, 9-11, Katrina, numerous government shutdowns, continuing resolutions, administration and policy changes, and the Budget Control Act of 2011. Through all of these national emergencies and disruptions, we have diligently continued to serve important missions at the IRS, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice, just to name a few. The purpose of my testimony today is to share my firsthand insights about the detrimental impact that category management is having on the small business supplier base. Category management has disproportionately stripped small, minority, and woman-owned businesses from access to federal contracts. It is responsible for the erosion of 30% of my own business in the last two years. It has widened the gap between small and large contractors to the detriment of our economy, and has reduced the availability of innovative cost-effective solutions for our government. Recent executive orders introduce a concept called tiered spending, under which federal procurement departments are forced to use a small handful of government-wide contract vehicles, best-in-class contract vehicles. These BICs, like Alliant 2, Vets 2, and Oasis, account for hundreds of billions of dollars of spend amongst very small groups of pre-qualified contractors. And of these vehicles, only Vets2 and Oasis provide a swim lane for a handful of small minority-owned and or woman-owned businesses. Category management and tiered spending rules create significant problems for small businesses. Whereas large contractors have the experience and credentials to qualify for nearly every single BIC, small businesses are hard pressed to qualify for even one. Competing for these big contracts requires a small business who have already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on certifications, have tens of millions of dollars in prior contracts, and meet dozens of other requirements that only the largest businesses would ever have. Here's a sobering statistic. Only 0.0001% of small businesses, that is one in 100,000, have access to 100% of the big spending. And these quote unquote small businesses are not small by most industry standards. They sometimes have $100 million in revenue, have been around for decades, and have thousands of employees. Of the tens of thousands of small businesses who might want to pursue a big contract, only a few dozen will ever receive an award. The small businesses who don't earn a seat at the table on a big contract are effectively barred from competing during the 10-year life of that contract. At the end of the day, the steering of government spending to large businesses results in the loss of millions of small business jobs. Large businesses are offshoring many of the jobs won on government contracts, including BICs. With a concentration of contracting in the hands of fewer, larger businesses, the government loses the benefit of competition to lower prices. Furthermore, when large businesses subcontract to small companies, they mark up our services by 25 to 40% without additional value to the government. Innovation is stifled. And let's face it, most of the innovation in today's economy comes from small businesses and entrepreneurs. And the hollowing out of small businesses in our defense industrial supplier base creates national security risks in countless industry sectors. As an immigrant, I'm not deterred by hard work or challenging times. I view it as my honor and responsibility to shoulder and protect the future of vibrant small business ecosystem in the US. 
and I'm encouraged by the protections of the small business included in the National Defense Authorization Act, including exemptions from category management for small business in all socioeconomic categories. Provisions like these are absolutely essential to protecting the viability of our small business contractors who have already been pressed to their limits. I am immensely grateful for the opportunity to address this subcommittee and for the work that you do to preserve diversity and inclusion in our federal government supplier base. I will gladly answer any questions. Thank you so very much. I cede the floor. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Alleman. We appreciate uh, your testimony. Ms. Casey, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Mfume, Ranking Member Salazar, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation. My name is Lenan Casey, and I'm the founder and CEO of Arc Espicio, a woman-owned small businesses that, have, that has provided innovative professional services to the federal government since 2008. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of the Professional Services Council and work often with other small businesses who serve the federal government. And this topic is of particular importance to me. Category management is an urgent issue for my company and other small businesses since it's contributing to the trend of de decreasing the small business supplier base and running counter to the purpose of the Small Business Act. In my testimony, I plan to offer some ideas and potential solutions to help grow the supplier base. My all of my remarks refer to professional services rather than any items or products. While category management does help increase procurement efficiencies, our company has seen it reduce the number of small businesses and the number of opportunities that are available for companies like mine to compete on. This in turn reduces innovation that small businesses bring. In terms of the challenges of category management, we have been um, competing as a subcontractor and a prime contractor with the federal government for 13 years. So we're very experienced. We've been on several category management best in class vehicles. And despite our extensive experience and exceptional performance, we've only won one of those. And that's after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. We are also a mentor to another small business in the Small Business Administration Mentor Protege Program under an 8A program. So both Arcus Bissio and our protege, which are very different stages of maturity in our company, have seen a significant reduction in the number and size um, as well as the scope of opportunities for us available to compete and pursue competitively. We love hard work and we love to compete. We just want the opportunity to compete. Many new and recompete contract opportunities for Arcus Bissio have moved to best in class contract vehicles where we were not a prime contractor and therefore could not pursue the work. Agencies have raised significant concerns about not being able to allow their incumbent small businesses to bid for their recompetes competitively. Allowing small businesses to recompete on follow on contracts after successfully delivering to the government should be a regular practice in small businesses. And yet, category management does not allow this competition um, and it, it prohibits innovation competition, and it doesn't allow for continuous improvement. In addition to fewer opportunities to pursue, it's very difficult for small businesses to compete and win tier three big contracts. You have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of certifications, and these big contracts often disproportionately favor small businesses who have extensive experience and certifications with the Department of Defense. And yet many other departments outside of DOD use these vehicles, um, but they can't get access to their current small business contractors. As a result, there are fewer small businesses, there's less competition. Um, and you know, while the revenue to small businesses may be increasing, it's to a much smaller base of small businesses. So ultimately, very small businesses are getting acquired, or are just dropping out of the market and we're dramatically reducing the small business supplier base. 
There are four potential ideas that I suggest um, and provide additional information in my written testimony. I'd encourage the committee to explore looking at category management for spend under management and exempting small business goals from the spend under management to expand the opportunities for set aside contracts. Legislation to increase simplified acquisition thresholds from 250,000 to a million or more is another idea. Considering legislation or policy to allow the GSA multiple award schedules um, for professional services contracts to be a BIC is another solution. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome further questions on my testimony. Thank you to the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Casey. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Holt, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Fulne, Ranking Member Salazar, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify today. I'm Victor P. Holt, President and CEO of VTEC Solutions Incorporated. As a minority veteran owned HubZone firm, we provide health, technology, and professional services. We most recently celebrated our 21st anniversary. Today, I testify as the vice chair of the HubZone Contractors National Council. The council is a nonprofit trade association that provides information and support for companies and individuals interested in the HubZone program. The Hub Zone program provides economic assistance to historically unutilized business zones by awarding federal contracts to Hub Zone companies that operate and employ workers who live in designated Hub Zone tracks. We would like to thank the committee for its commitment and support of small government contracting businesses. We also thank you for highlighting the topic of category management. This is a topic that the council continues to be concerned about. Council Chair Shirley Bailey testified in 2018 before the committee on this topic. Today, we are here again facing the same bleak outlook as 2018. The cause for concern remains simple, small business access to government contracts. Small businesses are the engine that fuels the American economy. We bring growth, innovation, and employment opportunities. We embody the promise, hope, and future of our country. However, substantial challenges and barriers still exist. The council continues to believe that best-in-class contracts create enormous barriers for small businesses. As the government moves away from direct award contracts, business opportunities decrease for the small business community. The large buying contracts used in category management require substantial resources to bid and win task orders. These contract requirements are barriers and deterrents that keep small businesses from competing. This includes stringent past performance or other requirements that are impossible for a small business to be. Subcontracting comes with its own challenges as well. This includes small margins and often alignment with a large or mid-sized prime based solely on cost. Big vehicles also have a crippling effect on small business competitive opportunities. Approximately 25,000 small businesses provide IT services to the government, but for the Oasis Small Business Pool 1, only 30 slots are available. Additionally, some best-in-class vehicles do not have on-ramps. This restricts the opportunities for future on-ramping for small businesses, hence shutting us out from high-dollar contract opportunities. According to Bloomberg government, IT spending represented more than half of the best in class market in FY20, with the best in class spending goal for FY21 at approximately $48.4 billion. With a large portion of IT spending going through these best in class contracts, winning a recompete or direct award may be even more challenging than before. Category management, when applied to broad acquisitions, does not consider that innovation provides incredible value. Best in class should not resemble lowest price technically acceptable. We hope the government does not mistake lowest cost for best value. As the popularity of utilizing best in class contracts increases, hub zones and other small businesses have fewer opportunities to compete. In fact, 
the government has never met its goal to obligate 3% of the eligible prime contract dollars to the hub zone community. This represents 23 years of missed opportunities and unawarded dollars to hub zone companies that can train, employ, and mentor constituents within your hub zone tracks. No one would disagree with the goals of efficient government buying and saving the taxpayer money. However, we believe category management comes at a cost. It can restrict the ability of small businesses to grow through federal contracting. The council urges the committee to exercise its authority to ensure the government's procurement policies, specifically category management, utilizes small businesses rather than limiting them. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and look forward to engaging in continued dialogue. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Holt. We appreciate your testimony. We will be back to you, obviously. Ms. Tong, you are now recognized for five minutes. Please proceed. Chairman and Fumi, uh, ranking members, Lisa, and members of subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify by, before you today. My name is Zafia Tong. I'm founder and CEO of TNT Consulting Services, Inc., TNT. We located in Falls Church, Virginia. TNT is a woman-owned small business. We specialize in providing strategic IT solutions to the federal government that allow them to successfully achieve their mission objectives on time and within budget. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Montgomery Chamber of Commerce, MCCC, in Montgomery County, Maryland. Today's topic is very important for the small business contracting community. The impact of category management is increasingly evident in my industry and affecting our company. Agencies are bundling contracts they were previous performed successfully by small business, rolling them into large contracts and awarding them to large businesses. The outcome of this action is killing small spire like ours. There are countless examples of this in the IT field. For example, August this year, the Defense Health Agency, DHA, awarded a large business a single award 10-year $2 billion blend purchase agreement, BPA, to support a military health systems enterprise IT service integrator requirement. By taking this work and bundling into a massive single award contract, a monopoly is created, allowing the large business to control and raise prices on the work performed for the government. Large business always claim there's no harm to the small business supplier. As contract consolidation happened, because they will hire us small businesses as subcontractors. However, the fact is large primes of, often take a sub, substantial cuts. Small businesses are usually given unrealistically low rates to subs, and they make it a difficult to meet requirements, recruit, and retain resources for us. The margins are too thin. Additionally, small business lose the close relationship we had with the government client when we were prime. And then now we become subcontractors. Another example, large business also use the high rates they receive from government to steal the workforce from small business. There are numerous instances where members of my team have been hired by large business that were awarded my previous contract, all due to the consolidation efforts. Unfortunately, my experience is that government clients are unable to help in resolving these disputes. And then third one, Primes has also bullied small business, leveraging their existing network and relationship with government clients to try to steal contracts from successful performing smalls. For example, we receive a sole source contract to create a minimum viable, viable product MVP for an organization under DHA. The contract is still ongoing and the customer are very satisfied with our performance. But because the contract is very important and could potentially become a very large contract, we were contacted by many large business wanting it to be part of our, this effort. And one of them is Google. When Google found out we were not able to bring them on the team, Google wrote a letter of concern to DHA, complained that DHA awarded this contract to a small business. 
this type of behavior is common and increasingly concerning. Although we have grown to large small business, newer and smaller and entrants are particularly hard hit with category management. Even for a mature, well-established small business with a diverse portfolio like us, contract bundling and consolidation is hurting this business. The cost of getting in a best-in-class contract is substantial and requires significant investments just to get a slot. Category management continues to shift an increasing number of dollars to large contract vehicles. Additionally, category management has accelerated the decline in diversity of vendors with large dollar amount held only by a few companies. The chamber opposed inclusion of provision in the FY 2022 NDAA by the committee to combat the effects of category management and any future bundling strategies. MCCC also understands additional factors are contributing to the supplier-based decline in addition to category management. Increasing transparency and accountability in subcontracting, as well as increasing R&D investment to maintain and grow in the small business supplier base. In conclusion, small businesses are asking for equity, a fair chance to compete for contracts. We are asking for actions from this committee to change the trajectory of contract consolidation which in our view creates opportunities for large businesses, but results in a fewer opportunity for small business like us. We need your help and appreciate the opportunity to bring these issues before you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tong. Uh, we're gonna begin our questioning in just a minute. I wanna again, thank all of the witnesses. I know you have much more to say and hopefully you'll get that opportunity as we go around the, uh, the table, so to speak, and have members join in with questions. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Allman, I'd like to really just start with you. Um, we all know that the ultimate goal of category management is to increase efficiencies uh, and to decrease duplication and things that harm the process. And yet what we see, as we've all heard today, and which many of you have given in your testimonies, has been an adverse effect on small businesses. Um, now, I know some of you, and I want to come to you in just a moment, had some specific suggestions. But Ms. Allman, what do you think we can do to strike the right balance as the Congress with oversight between uh, the goals of category management and ensuring that we still have a robust small business base? Thank you. Um, I think that the actions already taken in the House version of the uh, National Defense Authorization Act already address some of the important topics that, uh, that we've been uh, testifying on. For example, an amendment to the Small Business Action included in the NDAA states that all contracts awarded under the relevant sections of the Small Business Act will be classified as tier zero. In essence, they will not be aligned to category management principles and not be required. Uh, to be enforced uh, under category management rules. And it further stipulates that these tier zero contracts shall not be included in metrics related to category management goals, and that federal agencies shall not be classified tier zero contracts to tier one, two, or three without approval from the SBA administrator. This is a really important step to preventing future small business awards from being rolled up into massive procurements for large businesses as is currently being done with several of our own task orders at the IRS. And you know, as a metrics person, as a person who lives for numbers, I can tell you that people will do what they're measured against. If you measure them against what percentages they do in each of these tiers and tier zero is not an option for them, guess what? They're not gonna use tier zero. Okay. Ms. Ms. Uh, Casey, you were specific in your written testimony. You have four recommendations. Um, is it fair to assume that all of these recommendations that you listed are still very much needed and necessary? And if you would, could you kind of prioritize them and let the committee know what is the most important or the second most important as you see it? Uh, 
Yes, of course. Um, as Ms. Alman um, just said, the um, number one item would be to consider the language that allows small businesses um, and small business to be considered um, in category management such that they wouldn't get counted against the metrics. And so that would allow more sp small businesses to compete. So I agree with that recommendation. I also think um, considering, um, it, and if that can't be done, considering that for professional services contracts, considering the GSA schedules, which are very successful for both new entrants and current small businesses to win prime contracts, should be considered um, because they are competitively awarded under GSA. Um, and so they should be considered under category management. I would also strongly consider that um, you look at um, not only um, current SBA increases in small, small business size standards, but future increases that keep the strong, the small business supplier base very healthy are very important. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna quickly go to you, Mr. Holt. Um, you talk specifically about loss of competition, smaller margins. I think I also heard you say that uh, someone from your firm or that you were associated with came before a similar hearing uh, back in 2018 and that nothing has changed in, in many respects. Uh, any specific ideas you've heard uh, both Ms. Oliman and Ms. Casey, what are your thoughts on what we can do and should do immediately no, I, to turn this around? I echo what they say as far as uh, more language as it relates to the NDAA for inclusion. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges that we face as small businesses, especially as it relates to category management, best in class type contracts, as a subcontractor is playing with very, very razor thin margins. And we're, we're asked to do a lot with a little. And it's sort of like sometimes just going down the line to whatever company will sign up for that. So uh, what we're looking at is how do we hold these primes that we work with more accountable, understanding uh, their pricing structure that you see on the contract on the on the um, procurement side, and being able to say this is fair and justify what they're doing with their small businesses. That small businesses will be able to be perform. There will not be any false starts in onboarding a small business, a subcontractor, and getting underway and ensuring good service delivery to the federal government. Thank thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Holt, uh, Ms. Tong, I, I don't have any time left, so I will try to hold off my comments and questions for our next round, but thank you very much for, for your patience. Uh, as I said, my time has expired, so the ranking member, Ms. Salazar of Florida, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses. I wanted to start with Mrs. Tong. Uh, you mentioned that you mentioned, you said two key words, that you were being bullied and that Google had written a letter to an agency, which I'm sorry that I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't write the name uh, correctly. And I wanted you to expand on the bullying situation, who has been bullying you? And number two, if you could expand on that initiative, initiative taken by Google and to what agency and what did the letter contain? Thank you, Mrs. Tong. Uh Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this issue. So it was it was Google. It's the right name, Google, the giant. So um, this is a very important initiative taken by DHA um, for an organization called Joint Pathology Center. So DHA had conduct, conducted a um, source of before and then identified the solutions they want. Um, for this effort. And we were picked to be the integrator for this work. So Google called us and say, we have talked to the executive in DHA and they like our solution. So I told them say the solution was picked by DHA. All we have to do is to follow the instruction they want, put together the team to perform this work. So I told them say, I would 
try to help them look for the future, but I just cannot take them to the team. So Google turned around and then sent a letter of concern to DHA complaining that why DHA award this contract to an AA company. I don't know the detail of the letter because it would directly go to the lawyer of DHA. But all I know is the client, the customer asked us what we have disclosed to Google, which I did because we signed an NDA. But this is a very... So you signed an NDA, but nonetheless, Google had the information that it should have not had. It was, they got the information from the sources. So, and also I think they, they know something from their connection and the network in a DHA. So they come to me, oh. I just tell them, I cannot tell so that you. The DHA is working for Google then? They didn't so pick Google me, for this effort. They, yeah, well, they didn't pick so that for the effort. Hmm. So the sources saw so is a way that DHA find out what, could be possible solutions out there for them. And then based on their response, they will decide that what are the solutions they would like to use for this effort. So Google participated in the source you saw, but wasn't, put, wasn't selected. All right, and when you tell me bullying, besides this, what you just described, uh, uh, Google's uh, way of, of conducting itself against your interests, what other uh, bullying incidents have you felt or have you experienced in the last while conducting your business as a small business owner? So I have another contract as a sample. We create a software that was very successful at the regional level. I was able to convince the CIO to bring it to enterprise wide, and they are very happy about it and we support this idea. But unfortunately, they were told by the contracting and um, one of the organization that managed the money told them say, no, we cannot create more contracts. And I cannot say it's a bullying, but I think they have connection with the large business. So the work actually got pushed to a large business vehicle and it's not even an IT contract vehicle. And so our customer told them say, give, tell them, say, we are the one create a software and they're hoping that they could leverage us for this effort. But then large business just turn around, use the money to hire our people. All right. Very, very insightful information that I'm sure a chairman is, is understanding and that we can, we definitely need to do something about this and can continue protecting people like you all over the country that are being stolen not only their their intellectual property but their employees people that you have invested time and effort and energy into into training for now to be then just stolen away by the bigger guy thank you i think that my time is uh it's coming to an end i will get back to you in the second round thank you very much for sharing that with us i'm sure that is not an experience that you've only felt. I'm sure there are thousands of other business, small business uh, owners all over the country that are experiencing the same thing. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Kim, for five minutes. Why don't we? Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Holt, I wanted to start with you. Uh, in your testimony, you noted that, quote, with larger contracts being utilized by the federal government, subcontracting is more important than ever. Uh, you identify better oversight of prime contractors' compliance with subcontracting plans as one solution. Uh, I have an effort, a legislation I'm trying to put forward called the Put Our Neighbors to Work Act, uh, which was also included in the House Pass NDAA, which would require upcoming DOD subcontracting opportunities to be posted publicly so local small businesses have a better chance to compete. Uh, one thing that we've come across that has been, that we feel like has been helpful, for instance, are the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, PTACs, uh, like the one at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, which provides one-on-one -on -one counseling to help small businesses become subcontractors. I wanted to ask your thoughts, what other strategies should we be using to get more small businesses started in contracting, just trying to figure out how to demystify the process and help them understand what 
um, what might be feasible. So I wanted to see if you had other thoughts uh, about the PTAC or about other opportunities. Uh, we happen to work with the PTAC, uh, specifically um, the DC PTAC. And uh, they're a great resource for what we've been able to do. And they've been very instrumental with our growth as it relates to uh, having entry points into federal government introductions, as well as understanding certain programs that are out there. So I would definitely um, push the PTAC as one of those uh, resources for you. In addition, uh, the putting our neighbors to work, when, when you said that, I smiled because I always think of, you know, our neighbors as many different neighborhoods, but me as a hub zone company, that's something that I really embraced. And the hub zone council embraces that where um, we're always looking at how do we get subcontracting and prime opportunities put into the hub zone arena. Uh, hub zone companies, and I say this probably more than anyone, knows how to find these individuals, these neighbors that you speak of, that uh, we can identify, train, employ, coach, and mentor along their career journey and um, get them into gainful employment. Um, currently, I have about 120 employees in Alabama with the majority of them, 80% plus of them are in hub zone communities. And so when I think about that, working with various local agencies, the uh, Department of Employment Services, uh, working with PTAX, uh, working with veteran organizations who they're always looking at how do we find our returning heroes and our war fighters employment. So those are some yeah, of the thank you. that comes to mind. I appreciate that, Mr. Hold. And I uh, wanted to just open this up for anyone who might want to respond. Uh, but, but another issue that I keep hearing over and over again is, is about how small businesses often have fewer resources than larger businesses in terms of navigating red tape uh, and bureaucracy that comes with contracting with federal government. Um, that often creates these barriers to entry for many qualified small businesses from the very start. So I, I wanted to ask if any one of you had any thoughts about uh, whether or not there were targeted reforms that could be made to administrative burdens that would allow accessibility for small businesses to enter the market, and whether or not you had any thoughts or concrete, um, some concrete thoughts here about what it is that we can do. So I'll just kind of open that up if anybody has any thoughts here. I'll speak up real quickly. The Hub Zone program has never met its 3% goal requirement since inception, 23 years. There's a lot that can be done there. And I would offer to work with you on that. The Hub Zone Council would offer to work with you on that. Any last thoughts here, Ms. Tong? Yeah, I would like to suggest, can we uh, remove the JNA requirement for hub zone, woman on and SDVOSB sole source? Because right now, every time we try to do sole source for these three categories, the contracting officer refused to do so because they have to write JNA and it has to go through the lawyer legal to review and it takes a long time. So even though we have the regular, the FAR, saying that we are allowed to get a sole source, but no one is doing that, or very few of them. Great, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, the gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Stauber, the gentleman from Minnesota for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the, all the witnesses. Um, this is for anyone on the panel. Uh, what hurdles must small businesses, particularly new small businesses that are just starting out in the federal marketplace, over, have to overcome to successfully participate in government contracts under category management? This is for anybody on the panel. I'm happy to take that, Mr. Stauber. Um, new entrants to um, 
Gosh, to be a small business entering the market and selling the federal government today is almost impossible. Um, so to actually even learn about all of the contract vehicles and the experience that you need to start applying for those contracts start as it starts as a subcontractor. So you need to find out opportunities to subcontract. But then you need opportunities to prime contract. And there are fewer and fewer opportunities to prime contract on GSA schedules than there used to be. The GSA schedules used to provide a great opportunity to subcontract to get you ready to bid on things like a, a, a GWAC or a best-in-class vehicle. And so more opportunities to have... A, a, allowing more opportunities on the schedules so that small businesses can get the prime contract experience they need to then be a credible prime for the best in class vehicles. It's a critical pathway and very important. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else on the panel that would like to tackle that question or have comments on the question? Uh, so I, okay. Uh, so I'm I Okay, so from my experience, I found mental polyger is very helpful for the new entrant. So they can form a joint venture with a larger company, and then through the large company, they can get sole source contract or they can be, get subcontract opportunity um, to help them to get started. That's how I help my polygers. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ms. Taylor, do you have want to respond? Yes, yes. Um, so the, um, the thing that um, I'm looking for today is the opportunity to create opportunities for large, small emerging companies. So one of those is through mentorships over historically, and we benefited from large businesses under the Department of Defense's mentor protege program, and SAIC at that time was our mentor. We learned so much. They helped us with our certifications, but the DOD mentor protege program funds those large businesses, provides dollars for them to have staff to help us. So they're incented to. That doesn't exist in the civilian space. So for those that are working civilian, there is no funding for that. So, and quite frankly, I, as a mentor to other small businesses in the Women's Chamber of Commerce, I find that our smalls, our larger smalls, like the ones represented here today, make better mentors to the small smalls than the big companies because we get them. We're there every Saturday and Sunday writing that proposal. We can hit each other up on teams. We're talking 24 seven. We understand the world they're living in and we're still facing some of those challenges. So we're closer to the fire and we have a better shot at really helping them. So providing funding for mentors would be ideal. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, how much time do I have left? Uh, let's see, it looks like you've got a minute and one second. Okay, um, you know, I think that uh, it's it, the cost savings for our taxpayers, it's absolutely laudable, but it's clear that uh, uh, category management is, is and has uh, a punishing effect on some of our small businesses. And so I would ask any of the panelists real quick, what suggestions do you have to make our federal marketplace more accessible for small business participation? And just give me one or two quick examples, uh, all three of you with the time remaining, thank you. So I would quickly, like to start. I'm sorry. I, I would suggest mandating that all of the agencies use a forecast system to project out what their requirements are so small businesses can pursue both subcontracting and prime opportunities. And that is not consistent across agencies. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, so I would suggest to stop counting like the quota of the sole source and the tier and then um so set aside for small business toward the tier zero for the for the category management and then increase more sole source, more small business set aside for us. Thank you. Miss Elliman, real quick. Yes, yeah, so uh for BICs like Alliant 2 uh that got canceled for the small businesses. 
Uh, they only offered 80 seats at the table for the 400 small business bidders. Percentage-wise, the 50 larges that got it out of the 80 that bid doesn't make any sense. And YGSA stuck to their ground on 80 when they had the opportunity through the federal procurement process and the protest process to increase the ceiling to 120, and they refused. They just canceled it, and they essentially locked out small businesses from that big vehicle forever because they've canceled the procurement. It's only open for the largest. Well, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, the uh, gentleman from Minnesota yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses very much. Uh, this is a uh, quite an important hearing. I have many uh, small businesses in, in my district uh, throughout Pennsylvania going through much of what you're all uh, discussing and revealing, and it's appreciated and, and it, it, it matters. So hopefully we can take this information and, and do something with it. Uh, that's that, that's uh, what our role uh, should be oversight, but also effectuate some improvements. Um, and um, uh, Mr. Stauber's last question on what we could do to for you to make contracting more accessible, efficient, um, transparent uh, is, is a key question here. So I, I noted that well. Uh, I would ask uh, Lynn Ann Casey, in your original testimony, or your testimony here, uh, losing contracts, you've lost contracts, I'm sure all of you, all of you have difficulty retaining contracts due to changes in class requirements. And sometimes that happens sort of late in the game or, or during the contracting process. Can you uh, illustrate that a little more and tell us, uh, that just sounds like a very, very, very challenging situation. Should a contract requirement change late in the game? Yes. Um... Often um, we find out, we would like to recompete on a contract. We wanna do that fairly. We're not asking to be re-awarded a contract without a competition, but we are finding out later and later that um, our agencies are, are at the very end moving our recompetes to these best in class vehicles without even clearly communicating that to us. So we don't know where those opportunities are going sometimes, and we have to scramble at the last minute to become a subcontractor to someone who's on those vehicles. And that has happened to us multiple times, um, mostly because of the um, department and agency level procurement policies that require mandatory use for vehicles and for category management vehicles. And so often we see those switching vehicles all the time, so we can't even track them. We've had multiple contracts go to large business instead of small on category management, or to just go on to a category management where we're not a prime contractor. And it doesn't it, happen all the time. Is, is it explained to you why that occurs? Like the agent that you're working with, they explain to you anything? No, actually at the department level, they won't even publish what their policy is. So we only find out about it by talking to a contracting officer who says very little. They can't, they say they can't share a copy of the policy with us and they would like to get an exception for the policy, okay. but they actually are um, a, a afraid to put their neck out and go talk to a fair exception process in their agencies. And they right. really don't have the information to explain it. They just have to blindly follow the policy from their agency. Mr. Holt, does this, does this seem like a fair process to you? No, no, it's not. And it's a process that I've been affected by. Uh, we had a best in class vehicle being stars two, where we were doing cybersecurity work uh, with the Navy. And it was a contract that we enjoyed for almost eight years. Uh, when the um, option period was coming up, uh, they took it down to the wire. They didn't put it on the street. There was no recompete. And uh, that week we were informed that the small business work was uh, no longer needed. And I saw 
75 percent of my team um, absorbed in a prime who was already doing work with that program office and they just took them on. So this is something that has affected us personally. And um, what that did, that hit us, that was worth about $2.8 million a year in revenue that walked out the door. And, okay, I'm glad you, you hear this. Uh, sorry it occurred, but glad to hear it. I wanna, I wanna change subjects a little bit and ask about vaccine guidance. Uh, for federal contractors, both from uh, uh, those who provide product and service. Have you, in your view, received uh, guidance as, as, as it's to go into effect by December 8th, clear, understand, understandable, comprehensible guidance on what type of vaccines your uh, or level of vaccination and all that your employees must have in order to keep your contracts? So we've already published a policy for our employees regarding that, and we've provided them with timelines, options, the path for obtaining uh, legitimate exemptions. We've engaged, once the executive order was signed, we, within two weeks, we engaged legal counsel to, to develop uh, all, how we would roll that out into our organization. We've been on all hands calls with our employees. Everyone that is vaccinated has uploaded their vaccine cards to a private HR portal. So, and there are folks that will not get vaccinated that are not exempt and they know that their last day with us will be December 8th. It's okay. And I, uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I will say though, that I do hear from many small businesses that have federal contracts that they're they do not understand clearly the, the vaccine requirements, which they want to abide by, but they don't have their, uh, the uh, precise uh, requirements. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Pennsylvania yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as somebody that was a former small business owner and uh, and a veteran, uh, you know a lot of the questions today kind of um, nibble on the edges of what is the big frustration, and it's the same today as I think it's been for many years, and that is having the technical uh, assistance available to navigate the federal system. And, and I, I know personally, and I think if you talk to specifically a couple of industries, for the most part, the sector like manufacturing, or certainly um, I, I was very familiar with the printing industry. And if you want a federal contract, uh, you, you either need to hire out professional services that can navigate the federal system and the technical aspects of all the specs that need to be met, or you need to hire somebody that's full time on staff that uh, that can work and navigate, uh, like I said, the, the entire system. So that's a frustration that's existed for for many years. I, I would I would just say um, there's a couple of different angles I think that that could be helpful, and and I would like maybe Miss Tong could comment this and Mr. Holt for sure. If, if there were larger contractors that were granted uh, kind of a, a larger scope of uh, what they could enter into or what they could uh, actually bid on, and then the ancillary smaller businesses, whether it's a tool and die uh, shop down the, down the street or certainly transportation services, if there was some way of... of uh, enhancing the synergy between those two entities, do you think that would be helpful? Because that seems to be still missing out there in this whole discussion. And I would I would offer that to uh, Ms. Tong first. Thank you. So I think the challenge for us to working with large businesses is actually the, the path through they take when they give it to us makes it difficult for us. Um, Yes, they constantly engage small business, but they just didn't give us the good rate or like for us to be able to have margin or to to make to work efficiently. And like us, TNT, we actually have like 15 contract vehicles. We are able to bid and we see all the opportunities. Um, the challenge is more like 
um, some of the opportunities got consolidated, become a super huge contract. And it's just not something small business or even mid-sized company can fit. That's the main issue. Mr. Holt, do you have any comment on that? Yes, sir. We, we've actually had played on both sides of the field. Uh, right now, we, we are working with a large, um, coming up on a year, has been a very enjoyable, enjoyable opportunity where they have given us uh, custodial responsibility for the services that we deliver and um, with the appropriate rates. And that that's an anomaly. That's usually not the norm. And, you know, what the norm is, is that uh, depending on the health and uh, the needs of the prime, uh, a lot of times when the um, when the task order comes up for renewal or recompete, they're going to ask you to lower your rate. They're going to ask you, how do you lower your rate? And we've had it happen um, in mid contract before where I call it the bullying effect, where they uh, the prime will come and say, hey, is it any room we need you to go down by X percent? And, you know, we've held our ground on some and we've had opportunities where we just had to walk away because we couldn't do the business. So, you know, if there was uh, a way to have more compliance as, as it relates to the prime and how the government looked into how they treated your subcontractors, I think it will go a long way as it relates to compliance and oversight and um, in showing proper revenue share as far as the pricing that is being pushed down to us. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And in, in the uh, in the limited amount of time that I have left, I just wanted to touch on something that Congressman Muser uh, brought up earlier, and that is, Mr. Chairman, I think I think there's kind of a storm brewing out there on the vaccination. Uh, it, there are so many different tentacles that are kind of reaching into the smaller businesses that do work or are associated with specific type of, types of sectors, whether they utilize the U.S. mail or they may have uh, obviously DOD ties and you know what was presented, I think, by the Biden administration as something that was all only going to affect corporations with 100 employees or more. Uh, we're starting to hear. I am back in the district that that this is reaching down much further than that. And I would I would hope that this committee would use its voice to uh, to make sure we reach out to the administration and make them aware of that because. Uh, like I said, I think it's a storm that's brewing that that could become a big problem down the road. So, and I would yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Gentleman from Wisconsin yields back. Uh, gentlemen's points are well taken, and I will share them with the larger uh, committee on small business that might want to pursue that going forward. Um, we are going to pursue a second round of questioning, and I will uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Um, can any of you or all of you talk to the fact about whether or not you were not allowed to recompete uh, at some point in time on a contract and what was that like and how did you make out? Anyone? Um, I can speak to that, um, Mr. Mfume. Um, over the past three years, we have not been allowed to um, recompete on at least seven different contracts uh, worth probably well over $15 million of work um, where we were getting exceptional ratings from the government on our performance. Um, so it's, it's really significantly affecting us. It's been many, many contracts. Um, what ultimately well, ends up to, happening? We have to jump off now. So okay, see, so it's good to second round. What yeah, ends up totally happening good. is um, we have to give up the work, and then our people who are doing work at that agency then get hired by either the large contractor or the company on category management that won the work. 
Um, so it's hurting our long-term workforce and it's hurting our long-term revenue. And it's in places where we were doing excellent performance. I'm sure my fellow panelists have seen similar things. And was there any effort to move you into a best in class situation or? I mean, yes, and most of those were because they were moving um, it from say a GSA schedule to a best in class vehicle, or they were moving it from a department wide vehicle into a best in class vehicle. Um, so yes, it was because okay. of category management and best in class. Now I've heard the term bullying a couple times uh, today, and it's interesting because I think what I'm really hearing is something that Mr. Holt re referenced earlier, and that's the way primes uh, treat subs, and that there is apparently a lack of um, best practices or a lack of guidelines. I mean, we put in place a number of guidelines. Uh, if you are a prime, in order to get a sub, you must do this, you must do that. There are a number of things that have to be complied with. Mr. Holt, am I talking out of school? Did I? Are you suggesting here that uh, there ought to be some sort of standards that we can put in place, even if we do it through report language, that yes, would sir. that would give Prime some sense that they're being watched in terms of how they are treating subs to make sure this quote bullying uh, phenomenon doesn't continue. Yes, sir. That's exactly what I'm saying. And do you have any suggestions of what those standards or guidelines should encompass? I think it should be part of uh, their service level deliveries, um, being transparent with the government, as well as being transparent with the um, subs that are supporting the primes, understanding uh, what the expected revenue share is up front, where a lot of times uh, primes, they'll say, hey, we want you on this particular opportunity. Uh, give us your pricing. Give us this. Give us that. And when you go to talk about work share, they don't want to have that conversation. That's that's taboo. And uh, what usually can come out of that is that they start using us as staff augmentation as opposed to solutionists, where we can really come in and provide something that is of value, if you will, that we can create more effectiveness, more efficiency. And the, the, on the other side of the coin is for the primes to partner with us as opposed to just push work down to us that they may not want to do and that the margin may not be big enough for them to put their own employees in. Okay, my, my time is short. Ms. Tong, um, you know, you'd mentioned also your not so pleasant experience with Google and you heard Mr. Old. Uh, any suggestions you may have also to kind of prevent that from occurring in the future? Yes. So I think right now, um, government only look at the percentage they sub out to the sub or small business, but they never look at like what's the financial numbers in terms of like how much path do they take from the rate and then pass down to small business? Or do they even offer to pass down their escalation to the subs? Because we are asking, we cannot escalate our rate over the year. But you you know that people's salary is going to increase over the year. So things like that, if government can look at more matrix numbers, like or even use cost plus, look at like what's it, the actual cost they hire the sub, and then they just give them incentive on that part or the profit on the part, I think it will help. So they don't have to cut our rate in order to meet their goal. Okay, thank, thank you very much. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Ms. Salazar of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this goes for any of the witnesses and uh, any of the speakers, I would like to hear your um, your experiences. I have heard from some of you this this term of buying your staff and intellectual property for pennies on the dollar. I know that Mrs. Tong spoke about it, but I would like to hear Mrs. Alleman or Mrs. Casey if there are any examples that you want to share with us, specifically when another bigger contractor stole from you precious employees after you had 
trained them and invested money, time and energy in keeping them. So uh, Mrs. Alleman or Mrs. Casey or Mrs. Tung, let's start with you, Mrs. Alleman. I'm not sure if you want to share with us yes. or if you have examples where that we can illustrate this yes. practice that's happening right now. Please do so. so. Yeah, this is a very recent example at the IRS. We have developed uh, an award-winning solution for DevSecOps, CICD pipeline, onboarding, saving the IRS 27 to 30,000 hours a year for the automation we've done. And we've accelerated that with a patent pending unique solution that we've actually patented, won a national and international award for. We had a, they gave us, it was so critical to their filing season that they gave us, they issued us under the women-owned small, under the women-owned procurement preference. They issued us a sole source contract last year to continue our work because our large agency-wide vehicle got shut down by a BIC. And so, and that was full and open and it got shut down by the BICs. So they issued us this, this wonderful two-year contract, sole source, base, and option. Come September, at the end of our base year, we still had an option year that didn't need to re-procure. Instead of exercising our option year, which they need the support we provide, they bundled uh, a series of large contracts into something like $120, $200 million contract. So they bundled it and they said, no, no, everything goes under that now. So you got to go talk to them. So we did. We went to the prime Maximus who said, oh, no. We, we don't have space for you on our team. This is after award, knowing that our work would be shut down. Then they sent us, they batted us over. This is the bullying part, but it's, it's, it's almost like collusion. They batted us over to their key subcontractor, which we all know Deloitte is not a small. So Maximus and Deloitte, both of them telling each other in the background, no, 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 don't hire them. Meanwhile, calling every single one of our employees on that contract. And now the government is calling our employing our employees, the government, the federal employees are calling our employees saying, go, please go. We can't shut down your work. We need it. We've been off the contract for three weeks and the pipeline has been shut down. So I'm looking forward to January when filing season kicks off and they are not able to launch this because my employees refused to go. So they're sitting on my bench now, which is totally fine because that's on me. That's the kind of decisions we small business owners make. We choose where we, our money goes. We choose to invest our profits in our people. And that's why they don't leave during a shutdown, during COVID, during contract transitions. They don't go because of that. So that's not only predatory, but they're also positioned to steal our intellectual property. Absolutely. This can happen. And I thank you very much for sharing this this testimony. Chairman, you've been listening to this. We, we got to stop this somehow. That's what we're here for. The government cannot be stealing away from the private sector. So thank you, Mrs. Alleman. I think I have a, a couple of more minutes. And Mrs. Casey, would you like to share some of your experiences with us? I too have had uh, similar experiences where large businesses have signed subcontracts with us and have given us a work share. Say 30% of the work is supposed to be performed by um, our Cospicio. And if we're lucky, we'll get five to 10% of that revenue and nobody holds the prime accountable. And there's no way, um, you know, they have a lot of lawyers and there's no way we can kind of argue with them about standing forward with their teaming agreements, but they use our teaming agreements to actually win the contracts in the first place. So they say, we're going to team with Arcus Bissio, they're going to do all this work. And then afterwards, they don't do that. And I too have had similar experiences where a large prime contractor has literally taken one of my employees, given that employee to one of the other small businesses on the contract. And on Friday, they leave us and, and they say that person won't work there. And on Monday, they're there working on the same contract for another small business. Incredible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Thank you very much for sharing both of you. And I'm sure that we will, we're gonna take action into this. And, uh, and uh, I thanks once again, I have to yield back. I don't have any more time. The, uh, the gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes again, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. 
thanks everyone uh, again for all this important information. And I agree with Ms. Salazar. We, we certainly need to uh, help and, yes. and act upon it. Um, so in a couple of the testimonies and in the discussion that just took place, mm -hmm. this you know, uh, um, Ms. Alleman referred to it as predatory joint ventures between large and small firms, and that's been discussed. But I want to uh, delve into that a little bit further here, uh, where these uh, larger firms will set up subsidiaries or just new companies and set up joint uh, ventures, and uh, therefore are able to capture uh, um, <clears throat> contracts uh, that they wouldn't normally be able to uh, capture. And so large companies can do that and then perhaps undercut along the way. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that, that's capitalism to an extent, right? I mean, if you can do something better, you're going to be able to sell it for less. But when you're engaged in a deliberate, truly uh, uh, manipulative manner uh, that is not outlined in a contract it doesn't state hey if you want to get a small business contract or minority owned contract or veteran owned contract you can't just set up a company with those people as as uh, as owners and and therefore now you're eligible i mean that's just clearly against the grain and inappropriate and shouldn't be done and perhaps should be illegal um is that Something that you now you've been mentioning it, but but I'll go to uh, Lynn Ann Casey. Uh, Ms. Casey, is that something that small business experiences related to federal contracts? I would say that there are certain situations where large business primes enter into joint ventures, um, and um, I would call them serial joint ventures, um, where they do it over and over and over. Um, I think joint ventures are a good thing for small businesses, especially under the mentoring programs, but I would look to maybe limit how often a large business could enter into those joint ventures and whether they're, they're serial joint ventures and therefore preventing um, other small businesses um, from benefiting. Yeah, it has to be a legitimate joint venture, not, not just a spinoff. Um, would someone else like to comment on that? Yeah, can I? So my situation is my mentor, they actually have so many proteges. So which makes our joint venture wasn't as fruitful as I wish it would it would be, because just within us is a fruit fight. It's a fruit fight within us. And so I, I want to echo what Ms. Casey say, living the limit the number of proteges they can have. Because like we can only have two mentors, but they they can have at a minimum three at the same time within SBA and not to mention on other agencies like DOD or uh, Treasury. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Alleman or uh, anyone else care to comment? So I'm a big fan of capitalism. I'm a Cuban American immigrant. This is what my parents brought me here to this country to do. I believe in America, freedom, the opportunities that it provides. I will live and die by that. Um, and I can tell you that I hear the pain in Lynn Ann and Victor and, and Sophia's voice because I, I, we've all been there. And any small business owner that you put in front of a room and you say, oh, has this ever happened to you? The intent of joint ventures is a good one, just like category management. It's a good one. It's to relieve the pressure of procurement offices. But, but the, oper the reason smalls, ultra smalls are gravitating towards them, knowing that they're still vulnerable is because they don't have a choice. So I think it's our responsibility, mutual responsibility, you as our elected representatives and us with a voice in our communities and in the organizations we belong to create that opportunity for them. Let's not, let's give them the choice. Let's give them the choice to get work so that they can put other human beings to work, which is what we spend our money on is other human beings. So I just say, create more opportunity uh, don't shut down capitalism. That's not what this is about. I promise you all the small business owners I deal with and these on this call, we're not looking for handouts. We're looking for right. fair competition. That's all. Perfectly well said. Mr. Holt, last word. You have about 25 seconds. Um, I'm, I agree with everything that's been said. I think joint ventures is a good thing when done correctly. A lot of times uh, we see that it can become predatory. 
where uh, companies come together to capitalize and create an unfair marketplace. So as long as it's done correctly, I 100% support it. Agreed. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back, and thanks again to all of our witnesses. Gentlemen, yields back. Gentlemen's time has expired. All time has expired. And on behalf of the ranking member, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Your testimony showcased the obstacles and many of the frustrations that category management has created for small businesses like yours across the country. And the longer we allow these issues to persist for small firms, they will be pushed out of the federal supplier base. This would be bad news, obviously, for businesses, but it would also be bad news for our government. So I look forward to working with committee members to find ways to improve our federal procurement systems while ensuring abundant opportunities for all small businesses. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. And without objection, it is so ordered. And if there is no further business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much.